afternoon, everyone. I'm Caroline from Cardiff. It's really nice to see some uh, familiar faces around. Um, I really have to thank, um, at the start of this talk, um, Andrew Kahn from Patchwork, who's loaned me his pathway as part of this talk, just to talk about the different pathways and comparisons between the two. And it leads on from the question at the back about <coughs> diagnosis and management and what actually we should be doing in the, the timeline for surgery. Um, so I'm going to talk about implement, implementation of anemia management pathways and what I've done at my hospital and some of the challenges that I've had and some of the challenges that you are probably going to find if you try and implement one of these. Um, briefly going to touch on what anemia is um, and what are the drivers to implementing change which are quite important if you work in NHS England. Um, the causes of anemia and which uh, people we should be treating. Um, choosing a pathway and um, how you deliver the service and then briefly at the end the results of my local IBIM program. So this definition of anemia and I've purposely left it in old money at the top because this was in 1968 based on 48 patients. So my question to you is have we really got it right in 2017? Probably not. I'd also like you to think about gender bias. Um, we probably should be aiming for the same haemoglobins in men and women. Uh, we generally are smaller as females, um, have a smaller body surface area, and we bleed just the same. Or we certainly do in cardiac surgery where I work. Um, so, what's the evidence? Uh, why is anemia important? Why suddenly do you think that we've got an epidemic of anemia? So, low haemoglobin. Um, we know that iron deficiency is the common cause in the surgical population, and that's probably where the WHO had it right, and that was a paper produced by them in 2014. Um, the commonest treatment across the UK, by some work done by TB Richards and UCL, is still a blood transfusion. And I find that quite frightening, given all the risks associated with blood transfusions. Um, we know that patients receiving transfusions tend to be worse and have poor outcomes, and I'll show you some evidence for that. Um, difficult to separate cause and effect. Is it the transfusion? Is it the anemia? Going back to causes, these are the commonest causes that we see. Um, nutrient deficiency, and as I said, iron is by far the most commonest cause for that. Renal failure, and of course that umbrella term of chronic disease. And what we know that in these anemias is some iron restriction anemia. So these patients have upregulation of their hexagon hormones. They can't uptake iron from the GI tract. Um, so what are the drivers uh, for change in your practice, in my practice? Well, perioperative blood management, new life guidance, your national blood transfusion services, and of course, the implementation of perioperative medicine. I think this topic fits in very, very nicely with delivery of, of perioperative medicine in the new, well, I shouldn't call it a new curriculum, it's always been there, but this is a perfect time to make the change. So, perioperative blood management, what is it? Well, I think it's enhanced recovery for blood. Um, so you want to get your blood in the best shape that you can get it in before you take the patient to the theatre. So it's timely detection and management of preoperative anemia. And it's generally poorly addressed across the UK. And this was shown in this audit by the National Blood Transfusion Service in England, who looked at 4,000 patients across 155 hospitals. And they looked at these um, standards, which are part of the PBM standards of the three pillars of um, PBM. And I just want to focus on the first one, which is what we're talking about today. Only 25% of these patients had some sort of intervention for anemia. So that's a little bit of difference from the, the data presented earlier today with what you said about what we think that we have. This was an independent source. Okay. So, now of producing guidance. And this is a summary of the guidance, it's now guidance 24, and it doesn't come under anemia, it comes under blood transfusion, so it's hidden a little bit. Um, they want us to identify as best and treat anemia, consider postponing elective non-urgent surgery if patients are anemic, and time surgery uh, with optimization of blood red cell mass. Now that is the challenge I think that we have. So, what's the incidence, what's the importance? Well. Andrew and Patchwork um, very nicely produced this paper in 2015. Um, it was only from Patchwork patients. They showed that they had a 54% incidence of anemia. Um, and what he very rightly commented on, it's a specialist group of patients. It's a specialist centre dealing with very different problems. So it led him on to focus some more of us within cardiac anesthesia to perform uh, this national UK audit, which is on a massive set of patients. 
and we found there was a 40% incidence of anemia, a massive variation in transfusions between hospitals, and there was also a variation in the incidence of anemia between <coughs> hospitals. This, um, again, is, um, I wanted to focus on non-cardiac surgery as well because I know that a lot of you don't work in the same field as me. But this paper was produced in the, in the Lancet in 2015 and it shows the collective hematic hit decreasing along the bottom and the increase in mortality and the increase in post-operative complications. So, what are the barriers to the implementation of change? I really do recommend you read this article in British Journal of Anesthesia by Manuel Nonat, who is the Professor of Transfusion and Medicine in Malaga in Spain. So he's not an anaesthetist, he's a, a man in his hospital who deals with perioperative blood management and does an excellent job. Now, he doesn't understand why we take our patients to theatre and anemic, <coughs> because in Malaga their driver um, they drive their patients' hemoglobin up to 140 if they're going to be um, going to theatre for a surgery that potentially could have a major blood loss. Um, what he recognises in this paper is that it's, it's the organisational problems in the NHS in which we work um, that we recognise the anemia too late. So how do we solve it? Well, some aspirational goals. So when I started working on uh, an IV iron setup in Cardiff, this is what we wanted to achieve as a group of anaesthetists. Um, an agreed treatment pathway. Now that's quite a difficult one. Um, aim for pre-surgery haemoglobin in the normal range. Remove gender bias. Um, a potential to superboost for patients that may have, we know are going to anticipate a huge blood loss. Safe blood, that was the most important, important driver for myself. And say, hopefully, hospital bed days. That's quite difficult to prove in a packed NHS where you can't discharge patients to wards or home. We appreciate that. Um, so that tells us something about potentially what outcome data we should collect. It's not hospital bed days. Okay, so some of you may recognise this picture. It's the good, the bad and the ugly. I'd say that's my MDT. Um, you can choose where you want to put the surgeon, the haematologist, the anaesthetist. And I would say on some days we could all vary between any of those people. Um, we have to get an agreed pathway with everyone that's going to use it, okay? And the most important thing we had to agree, agree on, I think, was the haemoglobin. So eventually we came around to agreeing that we would treat everyone with a haemoglobin below 130. Um, oh. And even our haematologists agreed that if we tried to optimise the haemoglobin to 130, we would unlikely hit the transfusion trigger at any point in the hospital stay. So what else do you have to ask your group? Well, who are you going to treat? It's very straightforward for me because I only deal with one patient group. Where are you going to deliver the service? Which drugs are you going to use? Um, how are you going to time the surgery? And what outcome data are you going to collect? And as I said, I didn't think hospital bed days was a good one. So um, I'm going to look at Cambridge's pathway and my own pathway in uh, Cardiff. So both pathways have a common um, start point. Get a full blood count as soon as possible as soon as possible. And that leads nicely into some of the questions we've had already, is should this really be in primary care? If you can't do that, um, it's going to be in your pre-assessment clinic somewhere at some point. In my own hospital, um, it's when the surgeon sees the patients. Um, and this will trigger a pre-assessment nurse to look at the full blood counts, and then they will go on to our anemia management pathway if they've got a haemoglobin below 130. Now, Andy's... Uh, um, pathway is a full workup, diagnosis and treatment and, inter uh, and intervention. Mine is very, very simple because we want to get the patient in the pathway and into theatre within six weeks. And that's where the pathways differ, it's because of the timing. So this um, pathway is from the Anemia Clinic in Cottage Hospital. It's all ava also available um, in the international consensus statement which is about to be published in anesthesia in March. Um, it's a very, very good pathway and in-depth pathway to follow. Um, this is my pathway. We only look at haemoglobin and ferritin, and we treat all patients with a haemoglobin below 130 and a ferritin less than 100. And I'll just point out that this, this, this part of the pathway, this one um, and this one, all receive intravenous iron. Um, in Andy's pathway, he looks at patients with absolute iron deficiency. So this is a ferritin below 30. Um, 
and they were thrown into the industrial piece. So that covers the question that we had earlier this morning. Um, I've gone back and asked our surgeons what um, patients that they would consider referring, um, and they say they refer all of them that are diagnosed with anemia. And the results that they have, about 20% of them have gastritis, and there's been one occult carcinoma in 15 years. So I don't think it's a reason to refer your patient for surgery. Go on and treat it. It's unlikely that you're going to be missing anything. Okay. Um, this, again, is part of Andy's pathway. If you want to treat patients um, who have got, that strongly suggest an iron deficiency. And then that is how they would list their patient for theatre. We don't have the luxury of doing that in Cardiff. They come to surgery uh, clinic, they have a haemoglobin and ferritin, they're given the iron if they fit the pathway, and they're brought in for surgery six weeks later. So I recommend that you read this when it's published in anaesthesia um, because it's got some very good guidance on who to give oral iron to and who to give intravenous iron to. So coming on to which drug. Um, Oral iron needs time. There's nothing wrong with it. It does work in some patients. Um, and the current recommendations are six to eight weeks before surgery. And you need 40 to 60 milligrams of elemental iron. So it just depends which preparation you have in your hospital. But it takes about three months to fully restore your iron stores. So if your patient is going to have a blood loss and you've just managed to improve their hemoglobin by 10, this probably isn't the right guideline to be following. Um, also, you will know that patients complain about the side effects of oral iron in terms of GI complications. I think most of us sit in this group. If you haven't got time, um, the GP has tried oral iron therapy. We've got a pressure to get the patient through for theatre. Um, you probably need to think about intravenous iron. There's a lot of evidence out there at the moment. Uh, the first few papers, I think, show the... Um, the pro for intravenous iron, and I look forward to reading these uh, later in the year. The IBICA and PREVENT trials, which are on major general surgery, and then the PAVIAR study, um, of which I'm a PI on, which is aimed at cardiac surgery. So, our experience in Cardiff, we give patients total, do total dose intravenous iron, so we're not getting doses of a gram, which a lot of the current preparations on the market suggest a gram. We give a preparation where you can give total dose back. All of the patients that we've treated so far have had um, infusions of 1.2 to 1.8 grams because it's based on body weight and we've got some big patients in between there. Um, it's one visit, it's a day case, um, it takes minimal nursing time, it's got very good um, safety profile. One of the barriers that I encountered right at the start is the surgical group that I was dealing with thought that iron was related to anaphylaxis and they didn't want us to give the patients iron. Um, we change that around by saying we give the patients ketoroxine every day, um, and our incidence of anaphylaxis ketoroxine is this. Um, do you want us to stop give ketoro giving ketoroxine? So the answer was no, so we implemented giving iron. Um, and we've had no major adverse events to date. Um, the irons do can have a complex calculation for working out how much you need to give. Um, we've simplified this in Cardiff based on weight. And this prescription is available on the college website for you to have a look at if you want to use it. Um, these were our first results. Now, you might see here, gosh, it's very high hemoglobin to give somebody iron. This is what happens when you start any new pathway and you have a handover period to nursing staff or other members of the team that are going to run it for you. You will have a few errors at the start, okay? So I was pleased to see that even with a hemoglobin of 155, it went up to 170. So that's really good. But uh, as we carry on through the pathway, you can see it got a little bit better, and we were treating the right patients, and they were all getting a hemoglobin increase. Now, what does that mean in real terms? Well, these were the changes in hemoglobin of all of the patients we treated on um, up till the end of December. So you can see some patients had a huge hemoglobin rise, and some continue to decrease. I have no doubt in my mind that's because we only look at one thing in Cardiff. What I would say about these patients is they only received one unit of blood for their heart surgery, and these patients didn't receive any. So, I've looked at my own data. Uh, it's not a complete data set yet, but so far, the non anemics by far do the best. And the reason for that is they haven't got an underlying cause, they've got a high hemoglobin, they never hit the transfusion trigger. Our untreated anemics don't do very well. Some of them 
about 14 units of blood for one of them. Um, and the mean median cancer means you need two units of blood and a mortality sense of that of about 60 patients. Um, the ones that we treated with iron had a median cancer region of one. So that was those patients that you can see at the bottom of the line and a lower mortality. And to me, that's by far the most important thing. So we fulfilled the NHBT, NHFBT standards and the PBM standards, I feel, with our pathway. Probably the most important thing is to get your patients engaged. So at the minute, um, we have this little storyboard outside the um, surgeon's room where they, where they see the patients. And it's got um, a list of why iron is important, why anemia is important, and the hazards of transfusion. So when we call them in to come in for intravenous iron, they really want to come in and they get some of them back to the hospital where they're from. So in summary, anemia is a significant healthcare burden um, with a large impact on outcome. Iron deficiency is the commonest cause. Um, I think it's a pretty easy and safe treatment, which is my experience so far. And diagnosis and treatment are mandated by these groups, so we should be thinking about implementing it in our hospitals. If you're really, really interested, go to this meeting. Um, they talk a lot about management strategies um, of anemia across the world, and that's where I have a lot of my information for leading up to this. Thank you.